Good afternoon, and welcome to today's editorial webinar on setting up a pharma clean room. My name is Karen Langhauser, and I'm the Chief Content Director for Pharma Manufacturing, which is producing this event. This event is part of Pharma Manufacturing's Thought Leadership Series, which consists of several editorial-driven webinars on important industry topics throughout the year. Today we're going to talk about clean rooms. The demand for clean rooms used in pharma facilities continues to grow significantly. Right now, it's estimated that there are around 8,000 installed and used pharma clean rooms worldwide, and that number is expected to grow to 11,000 by 2025 and 15,000 by 2030. Constructing and qualifying a new clean room is a huge investment of a company's time, money, and resources, and quite frankly, something you want to get right the first time around. In today's webinar, you will get a high-level overview on setting up a clean room in the pharma industry. Our expert speaker will walk you through understanding classifications, qualification, clean room design, and validation. We will also discuss the importance of ongoing environmental monitoring and microbial control. First, I want to take a minute to thank today's webinar sponsor, Meritex. It is no surprise that employees are the most common source of contamination in clean rooms. A leader in automated hygiene technology, Meritex eliminates cross-contamination risk from hands and footwear with fully automated, validated, and standardized employee hygiene technology. The company's clean tech systems remove more than 99.9% .9 of harmful pathogens in just 12 seconds, protecting your time, product, customer, and brand. You can find more information about Meritech in the handouts section on your screen. To complement today's clean room discussion, we will have a live audience-driven Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please submit your questions as they occur to you. Before I introduce today's expert speaker, there are just a few housekeeping issues that I need to review. On your screen, you should have four primary sections. The upper left, or audio section, allows you to adjust the volume. Just hover over this section until you see the audio volume control to adjust it. Below that is the ask a question box. Not surprisingly, this is where you can ask questions. At any time during today's presentation, you can type your questions for our presenter here, and we'll get to it during our Q&A. And if you're having technical problems, you can simply type your concern in the Q&A box and one of our technical engineers will come to your rescue. Underneath the Ask a Question box is our handouts area. Here you'll find additional information available for download. In the largest section, you'll see today's presentation slides displayed. And below the slides, you'll see a live chat box. You can have a friendly chat with your fellow webinar attendees using this feature, but please avoid putting presenter questions in this area because there is a chance we will lose them in there. If you're having trouble seeing the screen, you can enlarge a section by clicking on the tiny box in the top right corner of the section next to the X. If you accidentally close out a section, don't panic. You can get it back by clicking the refresh button. It's the swirly arrow thing located on the far left of the icon. This webcast will be archived. We encourage you to direct colleagues and friends to the recorded presentation. It will also be available on the Pharma Manufacturing website. We've added a Q&A feature to our on-demand presentation so that listeners can ask questions that will be passed along to our speaker. And one final note, uh, we ask that you respond to the feedback form at the end of the presentation. Your answers will help us improve future events. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Marie France Quillen. Marie is the Senior Technical and Market Development Manager for Charles Ribler. With nearly two decades of experience in the life science industry, Marie has a proven track record of driving results within pharma operations. Her functional expertise includes quality control, lab testing, engineering, manufacturing, and quality operations. Marie has extensive experience in aseptic production and successfully automating endotoxin tech testing programs within a GMP environment. She has worked with specialty APIs, vaccine products, and insulin products, and is skilled in microbiological testing methods, analytical method transfer, sterility testing, growth promotion, method validation, and equipment validation. And with that, I will hand the floor over to Marie. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Karen. Hello, warm welcome from me, and I'm happy that you listened to this webinar. My presentation today is a high-level overview on setting up clean room in the pharmaceutical industry. I will discuss in general the design, classification, and qualification aspect of the clean room I will also discuss the importance of environmental monitoring program and microbial identification. As you all well know, Annex EMP 
I'm sorry, EU GMP Annex 1 is under revision, and I will not be discussing it in any details, but to generalize some of the information associated with it. Globally, there are two main GMP systems that regulate the requirements for clean rooms. The EU GMP Guidance Annex 1, Manufacturing of Sterile Medicinal Products, and the U.S. Food Drug Administration's Guidance for Industries, Sterile Drug Products Produced by Aseptic Processing, Current Good Manufacturing Practice. Both the FDA and the EU GMP refer to International Standard Organization, or ISO 146444, for the methodology of cleanroom classification. On this slide, you will find a list of references, which are all important when you think about validating and designing a cleanroom. The list is not complete, but contains the most relevant documents. Let's start and discuss what the clean room even is. What is the clean room? In a high level, a clean room is a room that is designed, constructed, classified, and operated in a controlled manner. Why do we need a clean room? And why do we need a controlled environment? Well, you need to control the particulate and the microbial and contaminant to protect your product and patients from them. Basically, its function is to protect your products from the contamination. I don't know if you guys remember the um, mold contamination uh, during the 2012 uh, compounding pharmacy where I believe 16 people died. At that time, the compounding pharmacy, um, they don't do it in a clean room, and that's why it is important to design a well-designed clean room in your facility. <clears throat> How do you know what kind of clean room you need and the cleanliness you need in your facility? That depends on your products and process within the clean environment. For example, is your product sterile or non-sterile? The table shown The table shown in this slide is an example of the type of clean room and classification you need for your facility. In this table, it shows the differences between the FDA and the EU GMP. The FDA only concerns aseptic processes while the EU GMP specifies for both aseptic and terminal sterilization. Classification requirements. A classified, a clean room is classified by how clean the air is. It is classified according to the number and size of particles permitted per volume of air. Let's look at the classification requirements for both the EU GMP and the FDA. As I mentioned previously, EU GMP Annex 1 is under revision and will not be finalized or published until the Q3rd or the Q4th of this year. The table shown in this slide provides an example of how the two major regulators might differ in the clean room classification requirements. As you can see, the FDA only requires to measure 0.5 micron particles for an aseptic process during the in-operation condition, whereas the EU GMP requires both 0.5 and 5.0 micron for aseptic and terminal sterilization in both at-rest and in-operation conditions. When testing for, for at-rest classification, it should be carried out after 15 to 20 minutes cleanup with no personnel in the room. While testing in operation classification, it can be performed during the normal operation simulated operation or media field for worst case scenario. At this moment, no one knows if this version of the air classification requirement 
by the EU GMP Annex 1 will be in the final revision of it will be harmonized with the FDA. So let's take a look at the EU GMP Annex 1 Revision 12 classification requirements. The table on the left is the requirement for the air classification for non-viable particulates. A non-viable particle refers to a non-living particle contaminant such as dust. As you can see, EU requires that air non-viable particles to be measured in two particle sizes, 0.5 and 5.0 micron in both at rest and in operation conditions. The static or at rest condition is performed to test the air quality when operations are not underway. The area is evaluated to ensure it's functioning to specification prior to the beginning of the process. In the area of dynamic or in operation, it is performed to test the air quality when process operations are underway and associated personnel are present. The area is evaluated to ensure that it is functioning to specification during the operations and with necessary personnel present. There are also limits to the number of viable particles or microbes in the air. The table on the right outlines the allowable number of viable organisms in both active and passive or settling plates. The cleaner the room, the lower the number of viable organisms is allowed in. In this case, in grade A, room expectation is no growth. The setting plate or the passive air is performed using an open auger plate, typically TSA or your triptych soy auger exposed to the environment, allowing particles to passively fail or settle on the surface of the auger for four hours. Here, setting plate is required by, for EU GMP. Now, let's look at the FDA requirements for air classification and microbiological quality. Here you can see in this table, ISO 5 designation has particle concentration equal to a clean area class 100, and is typically equivalent to the EU grade A. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the FDA only requires one particle size, 0 0.5 micron, to be measured in operation conditions during the aseptic process, and the passive air or setting plate is optional unless you are selling your product in the European countries. Now that we have spoken about certain requirements regarding clean rooms, let's look at the different phases of qualifying and validating a cleaner in more detail. We will start with the first step, clean room design. In cleanroom design, it is important when, well, when designing a well-functioning cleanroom, you need to start with a good process and, a use, and use a well-established tool such as quality by design and quality risk management methodology. The overall contamination control strategy should already be established and incorporated into design as well. What does the quality by design mean? It means that when designing a clean room, the manufacturing process itself should be the driver. The process should dictate the level of contamination control required and the classification of the room. Should be a design from the inside and out. What is the number one cause of contamination? We are people. So when establishing contamination, contamination control strategy, all the efforts should be directed at people. So the flow and the movement of people within the clean room must be taken into consideration during the design. And the process within the clean room should have a layout that minimizes the movement of the person as much as possible. What are the design elements when, uh, to consider when designing a clean room? It is important that you design a facility based on expect specification earlier in the process before construction begins, and that includes developing basis of design. 
fitting room design is extremely important that includes making sure the walls, floors, and ceiling surface is smooth and easily cleaned. The material should be compatible with the cleaning and disinfectant agents to make sure there is no pitting or any residual remaining from the clean room agent. Another design element to consider is your temperature and humidity control. It is especially important when it comes to the temperature and personal comfort and ensuring that they don't sweat. And if they do, they are going to share which causes microbial contamination in your clean room. Humidity is also significant um, as well in your design. Anything above 60% will cause an environment for mold to grow. So it's important that the humidity control is to be considered for cleaner environment. Another design element to consider is your HEPA filter. It should be um, designed appropriately and the positive pressure is extremely important to consider because if you have room that is not properly pressurized, then you can have issues with the airflow directions. In addition, the flow of personnel and materials are, are critical aspects that's also required special consideration when designing a clean room. Another design element to consider are the materials that you use in, in your clean room as well as, it, as well used within must be non-shedding and must be susceptible to cleaning and disinfectant agent. Any materials brought into the clean room that are typically part of the production activities should also be compatible with the cleaning and disinfectant agent. Usually, the supplier or the vendor will give you the information on the resistivity of to specific cleaning agent and the materials that are designed specifically for the cleaner environment. And of course, the disinfectant and cleaning agent efficacy study should be performed on the materials used in the design of the cleaner, including the materials used for equipment and movable equipment such as carts and tanks and should be qualified during the environmental monitoring program part of your clean room validation or your EMPQ. Now that the, you have the design, you design your clean room, what is the next step? Well, once you design the clean room, the next step is your cleaning validate, your clean room validation, sorry. Validation is an important process for any clean room. It serves to ensure that the clean room is properly installed and designed for its intended use and classification that all the components, such as your facility, your environment, and your equipment, meet regulatory requirements and other defined standards. So, what's the clean room validation process? Most often, clean rooms are validated by a third party validation agency. This entails a thorough inspection and several tests where after the clean room is certified to a specific class indicating its level of control, usually to an ISO 14544-1 class. Validation has several phases, beginning with the design qualification and ending in final certification. Some of the tests performed in these phases include airflow volume and velocity tests, your HEPA filter leak tests, air movement visualization or your smoke testing, your room pressurization, room recovery, airborne part particle count tests, relative humidity, temperature, and other testing conditions. Clean room certifications consists of three main phases, the installation qualification, your IQ, your operational qualification, your OQ, and performance qualification, or your PQ. I will discuss more what entails in these three main phases of certification in the next slide. So, clean room validation has five phases. Three of them is the clean room certification main phases. Your main phase one, or your main your phase one, is your design qualification. Here is when you verify the requirements you, dis you define in your acceptance criteria of your design qualification protocol. 
the protocol should address the user requirement specification or URL, your vendor documents and specifications, your facility layout, your purchase orders, your design documentation, your factory acceptance test or your FAT, as build drawings and data sheets. The approval of the design qualification is a prerequisite for the certification of the clean room. So, your phase two of your validation of your clean room is your installation qualification. Here, it also refers to as built testing. Testing is performed with all of the services connected and working that no materials, production equipment, or employee present, proving that the equipment is correctly installed to verify that all critical items that were installed are the correct model and or type, that they meet all of the specification according to the URS to make the room functioning properly and everything has been installed correctly. For example, types of the materials used in the construction, the walls, floors, your ceiling, your door, your differential pressure gauges, your ceiling panels, your light fixture, your HEPA filter, and your HVAC system. Make sure they're all been installed correctly. Your phase three or your third phase is your operational qualification or at rest testing. Testing occurs when equipment is installed but not operating and no employees are present. This proves that the equipment works properly to achieve the required environmental conditions. And this is also where you're going to do your clean room classification during at rest condition. Once the IQ and OQ have been performed and approved, uh, let the QC microbiologist take the lead for the performance qualification of the clean room. Here in your um, performance qualification um, clean room, your testing is um, performing with all the equipment installed and operating and employees performing their regular work duties and tasks. This test proves that the clean room has, has the required operational performance for the clean room application. This is when the EMPQ or the environmental monitoring performance qualification is performed. This is when the surface and the airborne particulates and bio burden levels are monitored and tested. Depending on the size and the amount of the cleanings, it is usually takes from two to four weeks to complete. Here also is when you're going to do your cleaning validation and your air classification during the operation. During the PQ, all environmental isolates recovered during the EMPQ must be identified. It is important to speciate the EM isolates because you need to understand the flora of your manufacturing environment to help establish your cleaning and disinfectant program. It also helps determine where the contamination is coming from and what control is needed to protect your product. ID generated during the PQ establishes baseline as to what floor is found in the manufacturing environment and critical in establishing the alert and action levels. Once the initial certification is, complete, is completed, it is important to regularly recertify to ensure that your clean room continues to operate as it did when it was built. At a minimum, Annual certification is recommended depending on the industry and products. Semi annual or even quarterly certification may be required. The requalifications gives the opportunity to evaluate the microbiological data, and the micro identifications are just as important during this requalification in order to assess any changes and risk. Once the clean room has been certified to class, the classification, a routine monitoring must be performed to make sure that the parameters have not changed or drifted and that the environment is under control. So what is environmental monitoring? Environmental monitoring is a critical tool set that 
ensures that manufacturing environment is maintained within the acceptable levels as defined by the FDA and by the EU, GMP, and other governing bodies. It ensures that the product is manufactured in a safe and controlled space free of contaminants. Why is it important to establish an environmental monitoring program in your facility? Well, it is important because it provides a meaningful information on the quality of the aseptic processing environment as well as, as, well as ancillary support areas. The use of environmental monitoring confirms that the systems are working to protect the integrity of the process and the sterility of your product. The data gathered from the environmental monitoring provides valuable information regarding the quality of the aseptic processing, and it can be used to help identify potential routes of contamination and lead to implementation of corrective actions before product contamination occurs. So when Establishing a, an EM program, risk assessment should be performed. When conducting risk assessment, it should be based on the detailed knowledge of your process, input, and final products, the facility and equipment, specific processes, the operational operations involved, the historical monitoring data collected during the qualification, and knowing the typical microbial flora isolates from your environment. They should be reviewed periodically to confirm that the environmental monitoring program is effective. So why do we monitor? Well, the main reason is to ensure that the clean room is in state of control. Understanding the flora in the manufacturing environment helps establish the cleaning program. It helps determine whether where the contamination is coming from and what control needed to protect your product. ID generated during the clean room PQ establishes established baseline and what floor is found in the manufacturing environment. And also it is criti critical in establishing your alert and action limits. Characterization of recovered microorganisms provides vital information for the environmental monitoring program. Environmental isolates often correlate with the contaminants found in the media fill or product sterility testing failure. And the overall environmental picture provides valuable information for the investigation. Let's talk about microbial identification. According to Annex 1, Draft 12, it is clearly stated that there is an expectation that anything found in grade A and B should be identified and the impact of the organisms on product quality should be assessed. An accurate identification is critical to assess the impact it might have on the product. In the new Annex 1, it talks about consideration given to ID of grade C and D contaminants for example, where the action or the alert levels are exceeded, or where atypical or potential objectionable microorganisms are recovered. It's not, it is not stipulated to ID everything in grade C and D, but should be enough info to allow for effective trend analysis. So when grade C and D trending can be limited if there's no ID obtained. So let's look at what um, the FDA guidance is when it comes to microbial identification. According to the FDA guidance, monitoring critical and immediately surrounding clean areas as well as personnel should include routine identification of microorganisms to the species level or where appropriate to the genus level. At minimum, the program should require species. Identification of microorganisms in this ancillary environment at frequent intervals to establish a valid current database of contaminants present in the facility during the processing. And to demonstrate that cleaning and sanitization procedures continue to be effective. Trending data on a routine basis not just during the qualification will help you assess any changes in flora type and number 
numbers and allow you to proactively respond to any changes in your manufacturing environment. It is also important to turn all the data collected during the environmental monitoring to see if there's any increase in your action and alert limit, if there's any changes in your microflora, especially during the, um, the seasonal shift, if there's any consecutive breaches or alert limits, or regular but isolated bre breaches of limits that may have a common cause, for example, a single excursion that always follows planned pre preventive maintenance. Guidance from the regulatory wants to perform our microbial identification. When do you provide identification? Um, if there's a buy burden from the incoming raw materials or API or active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, in your routine environmental monitoring should be um, IDing it, especially during uh, such as the air viable particulates, your surface, your personnel, your WFI, and your gas. Uh, if there's any objectionable microorganisms that you recovered, uh, such as E. coli or bacillus cereus or Brocalderia cepatia or other um, organisms that will cause harm to a patient, um, any uh, excursion or investigations, any out of spec, um, any product failure, such as sterility or media film. When do you know when to um, strain tight? When do you need to perform a strain typing? Uh, during the investigation, that results in the need of, to differentiate your between, your between isots of the same species. Let's say you have a positive result in your sterility and you recover a, a certain mold in your ID, and now you need to trace back to see where that is in your, um, in your uh, environment. Straining will help you pinpoint where the contamination came from at the strain level. An example of, of this um, method is the MLST or the multi-local sequence typing. It is a strain typing which is a more accurate and it can pinpoint the contamination at the strain level. So how do you know what type of ID method you need in your lab? There are Different types of ID methods. You have the phenotypic, genotypic, and proteotypic methods. In the phenotypic method, it is based on a morphology, biochemical, or physiological property. They are required a live, healthy organism, and it takes usually a couple of days to get an ID result. Example of this is API strips, uh, Vitec2, and Biolog which uses a, a series of biochemical tests which read on color change, turbidity, and precipitate formation. Some of the, those test results then may have a subjective interpretation and thus a higher rate of, of inaccurate or inconsistent identification. There are also a limited number of tests that can be conducted for this commercial system, so it can be very hard to differentiate closely related species. If you end up on, with an ID, often it will be a genus call instead of a species level. Now, many people like this, like this system because it's easy to use, but the system is often required um, ancillary testing such as a gram stain, which also you can, um, can be an error prone. If the gram stain is wrong, often the ID will be wrong and you would end up with no ID at all and tests will be needed, will be need repeated, repeated tests. Um, I remember when I started in the industry and, and I started as a microbial identification analyst and we had a, an environmental ISO that we covered in the class A and it was a, we thought it was a gram negative and when we did a, when we put it in the bio, like it came out as a salmonella. Of course, 
We have to confirm this, but since we only had one ID system, we sent it to Actigenics for confirmation. And when it came back, it came back as a bacillus series. So that, that, that's how important to have an accurate, um, first of all, gram stain um, when it comes to any phenotypic of uh, ID system. And finally, this uh, system often have limited library and, and are focused on clinical organisms, not, necessar not necessarily organisms found in the manufacturing environment. If an organism is not present in the library, it cannot be identified accurately. Another uh, method of identification is your genotypic. Uh, genotypic is considered the gold standard for microbial identification. It is considered the most accurate and reproducible methods for identifying a known organism. An example of this system is the Actigenics ID. It is a DNA sequencing method based on the sequencing of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene in the bacteria. The sequencing assay isolates the DNA from the single pure colony. It is purified and then used to set up the PCR or the polymerase chain reaction, creating millions of copies of gene of interest in a sample is sequenced, where fluorescent tags are added to each base in the sequence. Then the fluorescent tags are read by the sequencer and translated into the series of A's, T's, G's, and C's. Then this data is analyzed, assembled, and the resulting consequences Consensus sequences are compared to a reference library. Another method is the proteotypic method. An example of this a method is the Access Multitop MS. The Access Multitop MS determines the unique protein fingerprints of an organism and matches the characteristics pattern with an extensive reference library to determine the organism's identi identity. It is fast and reproduci reproducible, but it is not as accurate as sequencing and does not offer phylogenetic information. So let's look at how this technology works. Multitop MS, which stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight Mass Spectrophotometer. The organisms are added to a target plate. A chemical is added to lyse it, opens the cell, and a second chemical is added called matrix, which forms complexes with exposed proteins. A laser then fires down and ionizes those complexes, which break off and travel up to the vacuum to where they are detected based on their mass and then compare to a library of known spectra. Why is it important to have an accurate identification and tracking and trending the EM data? According to the FDA, EU Annex 1 and PDA, it is important because its significant changes in our microbial flora should be considered in the review of the ongoing environmental monitoring data, according to the FDA GMP. And according to the Annex 1, monitoring procedures should define the approach to trending. Trends can include but are not limited to changes in flora type and numbers and predominance of specific organisms. Particular attention should be given to the objectionable organisms or those that can be difficult to control, such as spore-forming microorganisms. The PDA Tech Report 13-4.6, periodic identifications should be performed on routine monitoring to check for changes in predominant group of microflora. A change in the microbial flora might signify a change in the system that should be investigated. As you all see, all three of them agree that isolates collected during their routine environmental monitoring should be identified accurately, and not only that, they also must be tracked and trended. The benefits of tracking and trending is to document that the manufacturing 
the cleaner environment is under control, or if things have changed or are going to change. It helps identify problems before they're being, be, they become too big. Uh, smart tracking and trending will help you to prevent contamination, contamination events. It would help you to move from corrective actions to the preventive actions. So in conclusion, clean room design, when setting up clean room or designing a clean room, the process and the product, product should be the main driver of the design. The process should dictate the level of contamination control requirement and match the industry. The clean room must be designed from the inside and out by using a well-established methodology, methodology such as quality by design and quality risk management principle. Not only this method can be used in designing a clean room, it can also be used in establishing an EM program. Having a baseline also helps with setting up an action and alert. Having an accurate ID will help you know and understand your environmental flora of your facility, which helps in investigation and determines the root cause of your contamination. Uh, routine environmental monitoring demonstrates that the rooms are in state of control. Increasing sample offers more visibility and accuracy into the facility, facility's microflora. It will shed light on what you don't currently know, but it will not sh change what is currently present. As I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the EU GMP Annex 1 is under revision and will be finalized either the third quarter or the fourth quarter of this year. Thank you so much for your attention and please reach out to me when you have any questions or need any support. Thank you. Thanks, Marie, and thanks for that um, really thorough presentation. Um, so we uh, have some questions coming in from the audience already, so we can just jump to those. So we covered a lot in this presentation. Um, what is the best place to start in developing the clean room? Um, well, ideally, um, it will be from the from scratch, right, from the bottom, from the ground up to design a, um, a clean room so you know what you need and you can design uh, the way you want it. But, of course, um, not that's not the case a lot of the time. So if you need a clean room or you need to um, change a room, there are other um Clean room companies out there that build a clean, um, clean room in like in modular, so that will be a that will be a good um, another um, way of uh, of um, having a clean room and designing a clean room and building a clean room in your facility. Okay, we can uh, move on to another question. Um, how important is it to trend microbial isolates? It's really important to uh, to to trend a, a, a microbial isolates because that's when you are going to see if there's any shift in your uh, base in your normal microflora, um, and also um, when you trend, that also will um, see if there's any increase in your action and alert level. And when you see that, that's when you can um, act and 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 mitigate all the problems, like either uh, clean room, how to clean it, you know, you're cleaning uh, disinfectant, make sure, make sure it's working properly. So this will also help you um, see if your cleaning program is working, and your environmental monitoring program is um, is definitely is working. Makes sense. Um, along the same lines, um, another question: How important is it to accurately identify environmental isolates? Oh, it's really important to have an accurate um, ID uh, because um, how would you know if uh, that I, that particular um, ID or isolate is the same as the one that um, that you see in the previous previous um, day that when you did the monitoring? 
Um, I remember when I started in the industry where my first job was was my COVID identification, and we were using a, um, a phenotypic um, uh, ID, which is Biolog, where it ID as a um, is a salmonella coming from a wall. So that really that really questioned the uh, I questioned the uh, the accuracy of that ID, and when we sent it out to Actogen, it uh, came out as a pseudomonas. So that's why. Um, Having an accurate ID and also having a um, a, a, a robust um, micro ID method method is really important to have. So when you're picking an ID system, um, definitely I would go with a, a genotypic type of ID, such as your uh, rubber printer or your microseq, to really um, be able to strain. And I and get an accurate ID in your um, isolates. Okay. Um, well, lots of questions coming in. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, what are the general steps to perform a disinfectant cleaning agent efficacy study? Uh, so, if you are just beginning and you don't have any environmental isolates yet, uh, that's when I would. Um, Usually, um, send it to a third party that uh, that does it a lot. Um, um, that's all. That's what they do. But if you're doing it in house, um, definitely you need to grab get all the materials that you're going to need um, that you that you have in your clean room to test and 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 also the um, <clears throat> the. Uh, <clears throat> The isolates that you need to uh, test it test it against, um, you can get that from uh, USB 1072. And when once you have then once you have all that information uh, and all the data you need and collected all the environment isolates, I would retest retest your um, your materials against with the against the and by, and against the uh, disinfectant um, agent with your with your environmental isolates. We're nearing our time limit here. Um, just a reminder for um, uh, questions can be continued uh, can be submitted uh, if you view the webinar on demand as well, and we'll still get them and be able to answer them. But I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, which method is more reliable for microbial identification? Uh, mass, I believe this is spectroscopy or sequencing? Oh, mass, uh, um, yeah, the multi-self or mass spec. Uh, definitely it's your, uh, your sequencing will be the most um, accurate one to, to, uh, to, to, to use when it comes to microbial identification, but it's it's labor intensive and it's expensive well, compared to the multi self or the protein uh, fingerprint. It's uh, it's much faster. So for let's say if we have a isolates um, environment isolates that we cover in the uh, grade A and grade B, that would um, I would definitely use a uh, sequencing on that one or sterility. Positive and sterility. I will use the sequencing on that one, but in other, um, other, I will do the the multi -tough. Thank you so much for answering all those questions, Marie. Um, just a final reminder to the audience to please let us know your thoughts on this presentation by answering our brief survey that will appear on your screen shortly. Uh, your candid answers are appreciated and will help us craft future events. Remember, this webcast will be available on pharmamanufacturing.com please feel free to share it with your colleagues. We also encourage you to visit pharmamanufacturing.com to gain access to even more tools and resources aimed at helping you achieve success. On behalf of Pharma Manufacturing, the experts at Charles River, and our sponsors at Meritech, thank you for your attendance and have a nice day.